Gabor, I am so honored to be talking to you. Thank you so much for making time on such short notice. And I'm, I'm, I'm so thrilled that it fits in with your new book coming out. But maybe first we could talk a little bit about your book, Hold On To Your Kids, mm -hmm. because I just so resonate with that message. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to know what, what were the sort of experiences in Canada that led you to see this so clearly that the peer group is toxic and how important it is to have that more intergenerational contact? Well, what is toxic for human beings is the loss of what a wonderful psychologist in the US calls our evolutionary niche. So how we evolved was not the way we live today over eons, hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years, really, the species developed living in small groups with multiple generations living together, with, with the children always being around the adults, with infants being held by the adults all the time, and uh, children having multiple playmates of different ages with free play out there in nature. Now, that's how we evolved. Now, human beings are infinitely, um, are almost infinitely adaptable. They can live in a range of environments. But that doesn't mean they do well in all environments, especially on our, when our emotional needs that, evo that evolution ingrained us with are not met, we suffer. Now, one of those needs is for attachment, for healthy, connected relationships with nurturing adults. In the modern world, that for all kinds of cultural reasons, economic and political reasons, has been eroded. So children very often grew up under the influence mostly of their immature peers, which is contrary to their needs and completely undermines their development. Now, I can't take credit for that book. The main author is a friend of mine, Gordon Neufeld, a wonderful psychologist here in Canada. I did the writing with him, but what he teaches is completely congruent with what I've understood about the way that this culture undermines healthy human development. You know, this was so amazing for me just in a few years to see how in the traditional culture in Ladakh, I could see that when the one-year-old was helped by the five-year-old brother, yes. that there was never a sense of, oh, I'm not good enough. There was a constant collaborative teaching and learning going on the entire time, throughout the whole lifetime. And then also to witness that the young men were involved in looking after younger siblings, young yes. animals. And yes. what that does to your masculinity is that it allows you to keep some of that feminine nurturing energy. And then I saw with the advent of the consumer culture, suddenly literally Barbie and Rambo coming in as role models. And as you said, you know, in that peer culture, the toxic peer culture, I always talk about that as being very similar to the factory farm chickens. You put 31 year olds in a room and you have created nothing but elbows, screams and competition. So we create yeah. structures, yeah, structures of anger yeah. and competition. Yeah. So do you feel now that people are waking up to this more? Do you feel that there is a shift going on so that um, well, what, what, what I see is that a culture, and we're talking about a globalized culture, because okay. um, <clears throat> economics and, and, and therefore culture has been globalized, and more and more it's becoming homogenized throughout the world. So that's created a real crisis in physical health and in mental health, and in many areas of human existence. As a result of the crisis that the system is generating, it is also invoking a reaction and a desperation on the part of people for a different point of view, a different understanding and a different approach. So the system, as Karl Marx said, you know, in the 20th, 19th century, the system creates, any system creates its own contradictions. So that, so that, so that as the crisis deepens, so does people desperation and, and hunger for a different point of view, um, magnify. And that's what I see happening right now. Yeah. And I also see that, that I, I think you also wrote that somewhere, but I see that 
people's bodies, people's souls, their deeper need ultimately are coming through. You know, and it's that need for connection. It's the need for connection to others and to life, to the land, to the animals, to the plants. And this is, of course, what our movement is about, what I'm calling mm. localization. It's yeah. the systemic turning away from the globalizing consumer culture to rebuild connected human scale economies so that we start experience seeing that interdependence between generations. And, you know, I, I, yeah. I travel quite a bit um, internationally, but <clears throat> particularly in North America, I think that at some time, at some sane time, whenever that will arise, people are not going to believe how we lived. When I move from, go from town to town and I see the same malls and the same corporate logos and the same franchise, cold-hearted, soulless businesses and the same uh, non-aesthetic architecture and the absolute lack of originality and they compare it to local shops and pastry stores and and, and artisans and and, and, and and hardware stores and, and it, it's this is going to seem totally insane and just the sheer boring homogeneity of it from town to town and, and from major urban center to small cities. It's all the same thing. People don't look back and, and, and the sheer bleak architectural bleakness of it. People aren't gonna believe how we lived. No, and I think you're being very, uh, you're being very kind when you say non-aesthetic and bleak because really let's call it what it is. It is ugly. It is yeah. ugly and it is deadly because yeah. What it is, is monoculture is anti-life and life is diversity. Every single cell in our bodies, every single individual, every single leaf, that uniqueness is what we evolved with. We evolved through experiential knowledge relating to and shaping our identity based on those connections. And part of that too was that every child knew that nobody was perfect. Perfection is part of the enemy, you know, the deadliness of those monocultures. One of the evolutionary needs built into the human brain is actually free play, free creative play. We have a system in our brains for play. Animals do. If you look at any mammal species, they play. And that plays an important part of their development. It's not just sort of fun and games. It's, it's there for a developmental reason. So what happens in a culture when you deprive kids of free play. And, you know, there's a, I think I'm pretty good because some of my videos have been seen by even a couple of million people online, you know? Yeah. But, but there's a nine-year-old kid <laughs> I found out recently who tests plastic homogenized toys. And he's one of these influencers. Yeah. He, he gets a lot of money for testing out toys. He's nine years old. One of his toys, toy little demonstrations with an utterly synthetic, unimaginative piece of garbage plastic has had two billion views. Yeah. I talk about globalization of, 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 and of robbing children of their childhoods by, 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 by selling them these prefab products that utterly drains them of imagination. You know, and, and, and this is what's going on in the world. Now, if you ask me in my book, do I condemn it? I'm not writing a book of condemnation. I mean, I'm not interested in condemning things. I'm interested in describing them and, and showing their impact. And so I'm writing this book in which I show the impact of, on, on, health, on human health of this neoliberal globalized culture. And, well, it's, not, and it's, it's not a pretty picture. No, and it's so badly needed, Gabor, and may it reach the entire globe because that toxic plastic consumer culture is reaching every corner. And I've been in the yurts of Mongolia and in huts with the Maasai, and I'm seeing this sale of this plastic, competitive, toxic consumer culture, mm -hmm. which at the same time as it's imposing this completely unnatural identity is destroying the planet, you know, driving up emissions and and the well, mining, yeah. You know, you know the, um, 
Yeah, so the, the, the title of the book, which will be published next April, is The Myth of Normal, a Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture. And the toxicity of the culture lies in its absolute uh, denial of human needs. Now, you're quite right that, that, that the culture not only imposes some hurts on everybody, it also creates a new kind of human character. The, um, the great uh, social psychologist, Eric Fromm, talked about what he called the social character. And the social character is what every society creates about how individuals are made to absorb the expectations of the culture. Now, if you live in a culture which is connected and communally minded and collaborative and respectful, you're gonna develop a certain social character. Uh, but if you live in a culture that whose fundamental belief is, or at least the propaganda is, that human beings are individualistic, antagonistic, aggressive, and selfish, competitive, then you're going to create people in that image, which is an utter denial of their essential human nature, of how we evolved. And so we're actually creating ourselves in ways that go contrary to our nature. And therein lies the toxicity of the culture. Even apart from the pollution, even apart from the destruction of the condition for a healthy climate, even apart from all the poisonous products that are, 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 are mass marketed and, and globally sold, just the way that we're made to be as human beings goes contrary to our nature. That itself is enough to make us sick. Absolutely. And then, you know, this narrative of us being aggressive, greedy, competitive by nature, that's been pushed on us, you know, and I've seen it pushed more aggressively in the last 30 years. Yeah. I helped to set up a group called the International Forum on Globalization. And so mm. we were a group of 40 people from around the world studying the impact of the trade treaties that mm. have been the contracts that have given corporations the right to dominate and control our governments. And that yeah. has meant to dominate science, to dominate education, to dominate yeah. every avenue of knowledge. You know, it's been colonized. And yet, what gives me so much hope is, you know, what you're saying is exactly what it is. It's so clear when you see, as I did in traditional culture, that we are made to live in a more collaborative way. Every child that's born longs for, needs that love and connection, needs to be held and carried by those numerous people who have the time, who have the patience, because they're not stressed, because they're not being pushed by an economic system into counting every second of the day. So, yeah, I I just, I think we might see, you know, you and I, before we die, we're roughly the same age, we might see a wake up where we'll start also identifying that neoliberal economic system as the driver and start looking at the mechanisms where we can actually put a stop to it. But in the meanwhile, we're, you know, we're both trying to raise awareness about that and we're encouraging people to connect locally. And I, I know that you would, you would see the multiple reasons why that's so important. Well, one of the neoliberal epidemics is isolation, loneliness. Exactly. So, so if you look at the statistics and the number of people that are lonely, they've gone way up in the last 30, 40 years. Now that is not simply an emotional loss. It's actually something that threatens human health. So people who are lonely, they're more likely to fall sick to any manner of disease. And if they fall sick, they're more likely to die of it more quickly because physiologically, we need each other. Physiologically, I'm not even just talking about emotionally, I'm talking about yeah. sheer point of maintaining our immune systems and the integrity of our cardiovascular system and so on. We need connection. When you have a system that actively undermines the social network and destroys communities because it throws people out of jobs without any thought to the impact of what that will have on the local community. When a Walmart can come in and 
completely obliterate small local businesses, that is huge impact on people's connection to each other and therefore on their health. And so it's, it, it, you, know, you, you can't separate the individual from the environment and this society functions as if we were all separate individuals. In fact, it's based on that ideology. Well, that'd be okay if it worked, but it doesn't. It actually undermines health. And so you have an increase in, in all manner of, I'm, looking, I'm talking as a physician, <clears throat> what we're seeing is an epidemic of obesity, uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, chronic illnesses, um, real epidemic of mental health conditions amongst the youth, increased youth suicide, depression, anxiety, children are being diagnosed with all manner of this or that disorder, all of which actually reflect the, the consequences of a system that denies children's developmental needs and fails to provide children or adults with a healthy connected environment. And that has to do with, uh, neo, the, with the um, exigencies of neoliberal economics. Yeah, we need to be able to say clearly too, how is it that our government leaders are so alert to trying to do something about COVID when we know that we've had these epidemics that are leading to, as you said, obesity, heart disease, epidemics of cancer as well. Why is nothing being done about that? Well, we can see that dealing with obesity, for instance, would reduce corporate profit. Right now, the way things are set up, dealing with COVID increases corporate profit. So we are being shaped, we are being pulled in a direction that allows the for-profit for profit motive of fewer and fewer people. That's the crazy thing too. There are fewer and fewer winners in this system. Some global billionaires, we're talking about less than 1% of humanity, and yet we are blindly going along with uh, essentially a system which taxes, subsidizes, and regulates to support this concentration of wealth in the hands of fewer and fewer corporations is really the issue more than individuals. Um, and yeah, we are going to be, you know, we're facing, for me, the worrying thing is that the breakdown this causes, the mental and physical breakdown, um, makes it, of course, harder and harder for people to resist. But at the same time, Gabor, you know, from China to, you know, Africa to literally every continent, we are working with grassroots groups that are restoring the connections and starting with food, which we, we see as mm -hmm. the most important industry. And also, you know, I've been saying for years that the two most important functions we perform as human beings, how we grow our food and how we grow our children, those two areas have been relegated to shadows and to insignificance. And in this localization movement, you know, we're raising them to the center. So food is an interesting one to consider because uh, you mentioned the corporations. Um, <clears throat> There's an endocrinologist, a specialist in human metabolism and in hormonal issues called Robert Lustig, who wrote a book called The um, Hacking of the American Mind. And um, what he means by that is that the corporations have actually sold and, 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 and uh, promulgated the use of foods that are actually addictive they're literally addictive. Now that's been um, documented by other people as well. So that the so the food corporations deliberately figure out which combination of salt, sugar, and fat will actually have the most addictive impact on the human brain, so as to create a false demand, which feeds obesity. And Lustig told me that as an endocrinologist, he used to love his job, but now he doesn't anymore, because He's seeing more and more children going up, showing up with metabolic diseases that only adults used to have because of the corporate um, driven destruction of local food production and the sales of mass consumption, uh, artificial foods. And um, the impact worldwide is 
you know, they, they call it coca colonization, coca colonization, the, the, the impact of sugar. And in the third world, uh, the so-called developing world, which is a nice euphemism, euphemism for, the, yeah. for, the, for the oppressed and the exploited world. But in the, in the developing world, they have troops of poor women going door to door, selling Nestle's products, which displace for a brother's, mother's milk. Yeah. To the to the effect of causing illness and obesity in children now. But and and just to finish this thought, so there's a Vancouver-based um, lawyer and author called Joel Bakan, who's written a book called The Corporation. I know and, him. Yes. And, and then yeah. a sequel called The New Corporation, and where he says, in American law, the corporation is considered to be a person. He says, well, how would you diagnose the person who sells toxic products, kills millions of people, and has no conscience about it, and continues to do it? You call him a sociopath. Yeah, exactly. And but these, are the think, that, yeah. these are the people that run the world. Yeah, but again, I think it's really helpful to see that it's the machine-like structure of the corporation that's running the world. Because actually, you know, if you remember in their film, The Corporation, they have a woman sitting there proudly, seemingly proudly, or certainly unashamedly talking about marketing to children of, again, plastic rubbish. It's the specialization. You know, I've sat on the stage at the European Economic Forum, you know, with a woman from Unilever, proudly boasting about how they're going to be increasing biodiversity from 10 major products. And when I try to say, well, in our localization movement, we are working with countless products. You know, we haven't even begun to identify them yet because we're so ignorant of the yeah. biodiversity of the world system. So we're dealing, I see the big problem dealing with an over-specialization linked to large scale. We're wired for connection, for care and love, and that pushed, and we're being pushed in the direction of competition and fear at an escalating rate. Well, there was a great, great scientist called Yak Panksep. I think he was Estonian. He lived and worked in the United States. Say, so, can you say his name again? Yak, J A A K Panksep, P A N K S E P P. Oh, I never heard of him. And, um, well, he was one of these wonderful um, neuroscientists and, and brain researchers. And, and um, he distinguished a number of brain systems that are built into all mammals, actually. I mentioned one of them. Play was one of them. Yeah. Care is another. Panic and grief, which has to do with the loss of relationship, is another. Fear is another. Lust is another. Rage is another because we have to generate healthy anger to protect our boundaries. There was no circuitry for competition. Competition. Yeah. There's no brain system that supports competition. Wow. There's no brain system that's all about aggression. There's the rage system, but that rage system is designed to generate a healthy, fierce anger to protect our one's boundaries and, and but all, all these um, assumptions that, that this society um, ascribes to human nature, they don't exist in our newer physiology. Care yeah. does, yeah. Care, care exists in our physiology. Yeah. And now the scary thing is the propaganda that robots will do a better job and that robots will be there to care for the elderly, that this, I don't know if you've seen it, but I'm seeing it all the time now. It's subtle, but it's all pervasive. The idea that human beings, greedy, aggressive, stupid, haven't done anything about climate change, they don't care, and they're destroying the world. So let's welcome in the robots because they're going to be wiser and kinder than humans. It's very scary. You know, um, I was talking to Noam Chomsky once, and I was interviewing him actually for the book that I'm writing. Oh. I've interviewed quite a few of the people that, have, that are appearing on in your, in your initiative. Here. Oh, good. Naomi <laughs> Klein, Russell Brandt, and others, you know. And, and um, I was interviewing Noam, and having grown up in communist Hungary, and, and having been a real believer in my, in my, as, as, as a child, and my parents 
and no adult would dare to tell me different, you know, because that would mean serious trouble if you went against the system. Yeah. So I grew up believing in it until the revolution in 56 in Hungary opened my eyes. It was, I went through what I call a series of very healthy disillusionments. But the point I wanted to make here, and I made the known, is that the propaganda system here is infinitely more effective and, exactly. and, and, and um, self-insinuating yeah. and, and invisible and far more clever than that crude party propaganda that I grew up with. Uh, Absolutely. And, and uh, you know, in, in, in the brand new world, in the brand new world uh, by Aldous Huxley, the social engineers talk about creating people that will want to do what they're expected to do. Yeah. We're trained that way. Yeah. We, we grow up educated to want to do what the system needs us to do against our own benefit and to yeah. the system's yeah. uh, further empowerment. Yeah. So 1984, not 1984, sorry, Brave New World was a very prescient and, 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 and prophetic account of the way the world actually works. Not that there are these social engineers as such who create people from a test tube onward like they did in Brave New World, but it's almost like that. Yeah, and you know, we've got to start by just looking at GDP, and that means we have to go deeper than neoliberal. We actually have to look at the industrial modern economy where nations men, me, you know, measure success through GDP. And GDP is a measure of breakdown. It increases with ill health. It increases with pollution. I just feel every self-respecting anybody has got to start being willing to look at that, at that economic trajectory and at the economic system as the main driver of all the destruction we're seeing. Well, so um, if you look at a human organism, uh, what do you call? Uh, there are the cells are meant to be in balance with each other and supporting each other, and organs are meant to support each other. But sometimes you get a cell growing that just keeps getting larger and larger, yeah. eats up the cells around it, or it displaces them. Uh, destroys the body's immunity and takes over over more and more of the body's energy. Now in the human organism, we call that cancer. We call that malignancy. Exactly. In the economic world, we call it a corporation or, yeah. or, or, or capitalism. And, and, and there's a Canadian philosopher, uh, writer called John McMurtry, who wrote a book called The Cancer Stage of Capitalism. And he, and he, and he has this concept called life capital. And life capital is anything that supports life. Mm. Oh, I love it. Like healthy food. I love food. it. Yeah. Like healthy, it's sustainable and it supports life. That's like healthy food, you know. But this system doesn't care about life capital. Yeah. It only cares about capital. Yeah. And, and and one of the chapters in the book I'm writing is called "They're Not Trying to Kill Us." And 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 um, what that comes from is this same Robert Lustig, this uh, endocrinologist who bewails the the rise of metabolic diseases amongst children in yeah. the last decades. He says is the corporations, they're not trying to kill us. They just don't care if we die. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's not like they set us to murder us deliberately. They just want to make a profit. But if, yeah. in a, but if in this, for the sake of the profit, like with the opiate, the, opiate, the opiate companies or the cigarette companies or the food companies or any number of different corporations, if a whole lot of people end up dying as a result, they don't care. Yeah. They don't prefer us to die. They prefer yeah. us to be alive and be good customers. But, but if we happen to die in the process, well, that's the least of their worries. Yeah. And that's but again, world. you know, we should be clear, you know, when we say there, you know, because again, I do see it as this corporate machine. I know, I know. You're trying to spare the feelings of individuals. <laughs> and no? that's fair enough. And that's fair enough. Those people have been socialized into their roles. Yeah, they have, but, they have, but 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 they but they do play those roles. They they do, but also honestly, Gabor, I'm I'm talking about what I write about in my book. I'm talking about people who went to work for the UN because they were idealistic. I know who go yeah. out with their development mentality. 
And literally, I mean, I have to live, you know, with people in Ladakh bringing in white sugar, white flour, and chemical fertilizers in yeah. the name of development and progress. progress. And they're not people who are not going to care if people die. But I, so I'm, I'm trying to address the blindness whereby people outside the corporate world and even inside it are perpetuating a, a deadly system. Well, and well, I think, yeah. I, I, I don't blame individuals. I, I'm not in touch with your pointing. Yeah. It is, all about, it is all about human blindness. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's why he said, if I do, I denounce the system. I'm not interested in denouncing it. I just want to say, yeah. look, people want to know how it works. Here's how it works, <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and here's the impact. Now, what do you, what would you like to do about it? You know, yeah, and, yeah. And, and of course, within any system, including the corporate system, there are people who actually wake up, and they're kind of shocked to to become alive to the impact of what they've been doing. Yeah, and yeah. they talk, and they talk about it. Mark Carney yeah. was the head of the Bank of Canada, yeah. head, of, head of the uh, Bank of, uh, of England. Of England. Yeah. And now he's working for, I don't know what, international organization. He's just written a new book where he said this is a moral rod at the heart of society, and it's called capitalism. Now he's yeah. one of the arch capitalist yeah. uh, administrators, bureaucrats, yeah. talking about the nature of the system. So yes, yeah. there, there are individuals who are capable of waking up. So yeah. It is not about individuals. It is. It is about the system. Yeah, but also, Gabba, what I would worry about is whether in that book he addresses the mechanisms whereby right now governments are being made to sign in black and white. Do you know yeah. about these ISDS treaties? These are investor state dispute settlements where governments are signing in black and white. We promise we will not do anything to reduce your profit. If right. we do, you can take us to court. Yes, yes, now, that's right. Because that big book, what was his name? Of the book on capitalism. You know, that book got out widely. Thomas, Thomas Piketty? Yeah. See, that book didn't mention the mechanisms whereby this capital is growing and yeah. whereby these corporations, through mega mergers, are becoming more powerful than whole countries. So, again, we have to be really clear about again i have to see what my mark Carney is saying now i know his wife was sort of quite green and i almost met her at one point but anyway it's it's really important now there's some very very clear points of entry to say wait a minute do you as even a self-respecting neoliberal capitalist believe that it's fair to force governments to comply this way, do you understand that you're supporting heavy subsidies for mm -hmm. your monopolies? Mm -hmm. We've got to really spell this out because I, you know, we have this weird situation, as you know, where things are sort of in the open, and yet there are secrets. You know, people aren't talking about some of these basics. So, well, Edward, Edward Snowden had a wonderful line. Yes, he was, he was being interviewed by Russell Brand uh, maybe yes. a month or two ago. And he talked about these conspiracies out there in the open. And he said that, he talked about, I, I'm paraphrasing him, he talked about the contrast between the banality of their methods with the rapaciousness of their intentions. Yeah. And yeah. he's saying they're doing this in plain sight. Well, that's just the thing, you see. What you're talking about is international treaties. Now, you walk down any street in Vancouver, where do you, you live in Australia, where, which city do you live in? Byron Bay. I don't okay. know if you've heard of it. I haven't. So wherever you are, yeah. we're walking down any street in London or New York or Paris and ask the 100 bypass, uh, passers-by what they know about these international treaties and their implications, they're going to say never even heard of them. Yeah. yeah. In other words, it's done in plain sight yeah. and it's totally hidden. Yeah, exactly. But okay. I also have experience of how it's hidden because I've been talking about it for 35 yeah. years or something. And just recently I was interviewed by the New York Times. You know, they came amazingly to do this long profile. I talked about the trade treaties, no mention in the article. What, and, a, what, a, what a surprise. Yeah, what a surprise. But it's just remarkable. And again, I'm, I think I am going to chase up that in fact, I did. I spoke to that uh, journalist and said, why didn't you mention it? And I think he said, the the editors took it. he said the editors took it out. No? 
Well, I think he said he thought it was too technical. That's what I've heard many times. I see. But it's, uh, yeah, put it in. <laughs> reality. Uh, reality is too technical. That's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, are you in Canada now? Do you feel uh, your book will be reviewed? You will get it out. This oh, yeah, it's, going to be, it's going to be published internationally. It'll be published in Canada, the States, the US, uh, U, 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 UK, China, um, I don't, really? I don't know, uh, Korea, I think so far, Hungary, uh, Australia, I'm sure, but a British publisher will bring it as well. Yeah, that it'll be published so in fabulous, cover. It's going to be such a gift to the world. I, you know, the the international nature of the problem is one of the big, you know, the biggest problems. It it feels too far removed. It feels too hidden. Everybody's being trained to look at their individual actions. They care about people. They care about the environment. It's what they do as an individual. And then they're looking at this theater of left-right politics, which, as you know, has become completely meaningless. And the sort of potential of doing things at the community level, which is what we're doing in the localization movement, where we're starting particularly around food, you know, linking up farmers and consumers. We're actually creating real viable lifeboats that, by the way, also lead to deep intergenerational connection that are yeah. remarkably healing. Have you seen that also in your work with addiction and mental illness? There's sort of have you seen, there are some beautiful examples, for instance, Johan Hari wrote about one yeah. in his book, Lost Connections, where the people starting to actually grow a garden, you know, yeah. who were depressed and addicted. Mm -hmm. And they say, as the garden flourished, so did they. There is that deep healing that comes through the community connection and the connection with the land and doing something that's meaningful and genuinely productive. Well, what I saw um, and I write about it in my book on addiction is I, I worked in um, what is North America's most concentrated, dire area of drug use by far. The downtown east side of Vancouver, for which is all kinds of historical reasons. But oh, really? People... In North America, it's one of the worst. I'm so surprised. No, one of the worst. It's the most uh, concentrated area of drug use anywhere. In um, North America or in Canada? In North America, but I would say almost anywhere in the world. Oh my God, I didn't realize uh, Certainly that. anywhere in the industrialized world. Really? And within a few square block radius, there are just thousands of people injecting and inhaling and ingesting substances of all kinds. Highly traumatized people, all of them abused and neglected in childhood. Um, and of course, they have to hustle for their drugs because the drugs are um, Due to the wisdom of our governments, are, are are illegal, so that so that you know they have to hustle for them and commit crimes to get them and so on. Um, while meanwhile, the tobacco companies get to kill millions of people every year uh, with without having to pay any price for it whatsoever. That's a whole other story. But the point I want to make is that even in that community of hustle and and fear and illness and mental health conditions and desperation. There are such acts of communal kindness and people coming together and, 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 and wanting to support each other. Even as they rip each other off, they still huh. care for each other. And, you know, and it, it, it seems like a contradiction, but it isn't really, because their addiction makes them behave in a certain way, but their humanity and their need forces them to, to actually care for one another as well. So uh, I, I saw beautiful examples of that there. That is so wonderful to hear. And of course, in a very different way, and I, I, you know, I'm not doing this to romanticize poverty, but I used to reflect on, you know, every year I'd be in Delhi and then every year in New York and San Francisco and Paris and London and so on. And I used to reflect on why did I get so much more upset by the homeless on the streets of New York than I did on the streets of Delhi. And I realized that in Delhi, they were in communities. They were even in families. They were intergenerational groups together. And whereas on the streets of New York, you know, with these isolated individuals, um, you know, well, without anyone in, to care. In one of his books, Michael Marmot, Sir Michael Marmot, uh, who studies inequality and health and so on, he he's Australian, I think, originally, and moved to the, moved to the England and the States, I think. 
but he um, he talked about how a person in poverty in the States is infinitely richer than a person in India, but actually much less happy and indeed even has a shorter uh, lifespan. Uh, so it's not just about absolute uh, monetary parameters, but also about uh, community and uh, one sense of value. What is one, one is in, in this society, if you don't own much, you're made to believe that you're worthless, that, 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 you, that, you're, that your economic worth equals your human worth. Well, that, that itself is a soul destroying and health and illness producing belief. But that's, yeah, what, and, people, that's what people are made to believe in, in this particular system. And in this system too, the, the valuing of just the left brain and the more PhDs you have and the highest status you have because of your many years of study, again, divisive and ill-conceived, you know, because we're training up, you know, this left brain, simplistic thinking. And well, let, me, let, me tell you, let me tell you about a study that I ran across writing my new book. So this is going to... You're sitting down, I trust, because otherwise you would fall off in, in amazement if I told you this. Yeah. Uh, this research study. I don't know how yeah. many PhDs it took to figure this one out. Yeah. They did some research, and you know what they learned? What? Are you ready for this? Yeah. They learned that grandmothers are good for grandkids. <laughs> you know. I, 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 and, and you know what else they found out? <laughs> this is even more astonishing. That the closer the grandmother lives, the, the kid lives to the child, the better. Oh, now, but you now know, how many how many yeah, PhDs yeah. Yeah. would it take to figure that one out? <laughs> yeah. Well, I tell you, I am so thrilled there are some PhDs figuring that out. Because literally just yesterday I was talking to a bunch of young mothers and talking about the importance of grandmothers. And right. I even in my own little informal study I've seen that those people who've had grandparents nearby tend yeah. to have more secure identities. Absolutely. And, yeah. It turns out you see that the heart itself has an intelligence. It has a brain. Yes. It, it has nerve cells which yes. are connected to the brain up here. Yeah. And, and what's happened in the West is that that connection has been largely um, silenced. Yeah. Um, so that no, we need to convince our intellects what the heart already knows. Because whose heart doesn't know that a loving grandmother <laughs> is, 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 is a terrific support to life? You know? Yeah. But yeah. here is we have to prove it to ourselves through intellectual study. That, that's part of the insanity of our culture, is that we have to keep proof to ourselves the obvious. Yeah. Yeah. And much worse than that, that we're holding beliefs that damage us so deeply. And, um, and, but above all, I would say it's the ignorance of the economy. I'm, you know, I'm finding, I don't know if you see a bit of a gender difference here, but I do find that women generally are a bit more connected to the heart. And if you like, you know, the right. They, they, are, the brain. they are, they are, but there's a problem there. Yeah. Tell me. If you look at who has the preponderance of autoimmune diseases. Yeah and non-smoking related cancers, it's women. Huh. And there's a reason for that. Or for example, if you, and, and I talk about this in my new book, if you look at something like multiple sclerosis, that in the 1930s used to be about gender equal, you know what it is, the ratio now is? No. Three and a half women to every man, for, for one really? man. Really? Yeah, no, there's reasons for that. Because in this hard connectedness of women, they're also acculturated to suppress their own needs to look after the needs of everybody else yeah. and that actually suppresses the immune system yeah so that, so that while it's true what you say at the same time in a sense that works against women because wow. it, it because they're acculturated to use all that hard energy for the benefit of others while ignoring themselves yeah and these are precisely the people that develop autoimmune disease for reasons i can't tell you now it's fully laid out in one of my books and i say more about it in the new one but but there is this gender ratio of chronic illness very much against women because of the the stress that that compulsive caregiving imposes on women. Yeah. And that, yeah. And that by the way, showed up during COVID. There's all kinds of studies about the impact on mothers of, of COVID and how the 
caregiving wasn't shared equally between the the, the genders. Really, yeah. well, I think the what I was going to say is that which is sort of in a way relates to what you're saying, which is that. I see the women having more of that heart connection and I totally agree. They tend to be neglecting their own needs. And I didn't realize that it was so dramatically at the expense of their own health. Yeah. But what's also problematic for me is that they tend to shy away from looking at what is essentially a patriarchal system, this techno-economic hegemony that is global, very distant, and yeah. and they tend to say, Helena, shut up! Don't keep talking about this. I don't want to hear about it. You know, tell me about how to grow beetroot or something, or you know how to better care for my children. But I'm trying to enlist more women into just stepping back to look at this madness of this economic system. As we were saying, how we measure growth, how we it is so upside down. It's a toxic anti-life system that is destroying us and you're spelling that out so clearly <clears throat> so i um i think that the slightly worrying thing that i see in the alternative movements including a college where i used to teach Schumacher college is there is now an overemphasis on the heart only listening to the heart and i always go back to quoting my Tibetans, you know, who mm. have a beautiful way of talking about the need for both compassion and mm. wisdom. Mm. And they argue that, you know, compassion without wisdom is dangerous and wisdom without compassion is equally okay. dangerous. But, but just a minute, there is no wisdom without compassion. Well, a very good point. Uh, very there, good there, point. There might be, yeah. there might be, intellectual, point. There might be intellectual brilliance. Yeah, exactly. But there, won't, but there won't be any wisdom. No, excellent. Yeah, I, let's let's put it this way then. You know, the brain without the heart. Yeah, absolutely. That's why the whole idea of intellectual learning and, and the way kids are educated, which is largely non-experiential and it's all thought-based, doesn't really promote genuine learning, because genuine learning, as it would have been in hunter-gatherer days, purely experiential. No. We've come a long way. It's not a question of getting rid of intellectual knowledge, but divorcing it from experiential knowledge is to render it um, lame. And, and I would say dangerous also. Yeah. And also, I'm sure you agree with the the need for using, you know, the your hands and your body. And again, seeing that in the traditional cultures, you know, these young children, I mean, boys age five, running up the mountain, using their bodies and learning practical skills and incredible also such refined um, um, vision you know they could see on a mountain you know a few kilometers away they could recognize their own animals and the sort of speed yeah. and intelligence was remarkable then you now put them into a cement box yeah, without no, windows no, no. literally uh, we're working with impoverished brains and and uh because it's, it's, the, it's, it's, the, it's the social environment and the physical environment that actually programs the brain, not, 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 not just our genes. Um, two thoughts come into mind. One is, uh, have you read uh, The Continuum Concept by Jean Liedhoff? Yes, yeah, she was a friend of mine, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. well, so I don't have to tell you, but just, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, but what, what was I gonna say about, oh yeah, the, have you seen a movie called, a documentary, it came out maybe 10, 15 years ago called Babies? No. Okay, so they took, I think it was called Babies, and they took four, they followed four newborns from San Francisco, maybe somewhere in Europe, some in Mongolia, and in Africa. And they followed them for the first year of life. And of course, the African kid is just held, carried everywhere by the mother, breastfed yeah. the whole year, yes. you know, um, never is never alone. Yeah. Always in the company with of, of, of adults. When the adults are singing, he's sitting there. Look, you know. Yeah. At the end of the year, you see these four kids, and the African kid. I don't have to stand up to do this, and I can really show it to you on the screen. But he's like, look, he's like just grounded and powerful. He's like a one-year-old little warrior. And by warrior, I don't mean that he's aggressive or 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 or, or murders. I just mean that he's just ready to take it on. You know. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and just so 
powerful in himself, so self-confident as compared to the other three kids. Yeah. He's, like a, he's like a different creature. Wow. Well, this is again what I lived through in Ladakh, you know, the children, yeah. they literally didn't cry. I mean, I mean, when I say literally, I mean, it was so rare that it was almost non-existent. Yeah. And, and then, and like you say, carried and held the whole time. And the more mothers, the better. <laughs> and the yeah. more that the boys and the uncles and yeah. grandfathers can be mothers, yeah. the better they are and the happier they are. Well, but here's what happens. I mentioned that care system in the brain. Yeah. But these instinctual systems need to be evoked by the environment. Yes. And when they're not, they just yeah. kind of attenuate and they shut down. Yes. So when a boy is taking care of a little one, his care system is actually building. Yes. And so that neurologically and neurophysiologically, he then be more prepared to be nurturing. So, and, and, and what this society does is in the parenting advice, it doles out to young mothers and fathers and in the stresses that it places the family under, it actually attenuates our parenting instincts. Yeah. So that we, we, we parent contrary to instinct. Exactly. And now being told also to let the babies cry themselves to oh, sleep yeah. and this and, you know. Just... When you let the baby cry, what you're actually doing is you're interfering with brain development. Yeah. If the baby's crying because he or she is desperate to be held. That's why they're yeah. crying. Because that's yeah. the only way they can connect. Yeah. So they're just expressing their need. Yeah. Well, that should, that should um, enliven the parent's care system to hold the baby. But yeah. if the parent is following doctor's advice to let the baby cry it out, yeah. they're actually weakening their own nurturing system. Yeah. And I've talked to a lot of mothers who followed that advice and they say the heart is breaking while they're doing it. Yeah. But, but that's what the doctor said. Yeah. So they're going to do it. So they actually go with the intellect rather than the heart. Now, you know, all I, write, is, I actually write exactly about that in my book, Ancient Futures. I talk exactly yeah. about that. The mother's sitting there dying to hold the baby, but she's been told not to. And then, of course, mothers of my, you know, my mother's generation were told not to breastfeed even. I mean, it's just like, yeah. it's so inhuman. But what, what the CNR has found in her research, you know what the average age of weaning was in a hunter-gatherer group? About three. Four years, yeah. Four, yeah. It, it was in Ladakh too. It, it went from two to five years, but but uh, uh, the average age was about four years. Yeah, yeah. three, four. No, and I, I've seen, you know, I've, I've lived in it, and I've seen, you know, also seen a culture where, where suicide was virtually unknown. Yeah. Now we've got at least one a month, mainly young people, who are being pushed into conforming to these standards, doing well at these universities, you know, distorting their brains, fighting to survive in a system where there are almost no jobs. So another thing this economy is doing is systematically destroying jobs while polluting the atmosphere and, um, you know, turning that around to stop subsidizing energy and technology and instead to subsidize human care in all its forms for the soil, for the care of children, how we build our houses. Well, if, well, you know. well, if you actually look at human care, so during the COVID crisis, it was evident that some of the most vulnerable people were living in care homes. Yeah. Where they were looked after by really poorly paid yeah. and virtually non-trained caregivers. Yeah. Now, if you also look at childcare, that's also amongst the most poorly paid. In other yeah. words, the most precious, you know, so there's nothing more precious and important for society than the care of children, but it's so undervalued. Yeah. And, and, and of course, anybody that doesn't contribute to the economy, it doesn't matter. So the elderly people, especially the poor elderly in these care homes, they have no value. They have no capital value. Yeah. Yeah. And since we don't consider life capital, what we consider yeah. just capital. Yeah. So the, and, and, and this is also where you had the worst outbreaks. And yeah. in, in Canada, there was a study that showed that in the care homes, the ones that were privately owned, they had the worst conditions. Really? Well, and at least that's worth something. They're also the ones who gave high dividends to their executives. <sighs> so there was a, the more people died, under your care, the more money you got. 
not not that they were being paid for the deaths, but I'm just saying that the contradiction wasn't apparent. Yeah, you but know. you know, the, to just step back and to look at how upside down this society is, I hope that people who are listening to us will feel that it's that is quite um, inspiring or hopefully positive to realize that there are economic causes of this madness. Because you said one of the most important things we do is to look after our children, should be. But also, what does it mean when we're treated like this as we get older? We all live in fear of aging. The mm -hmm. monoculture also is imposing this image we're supposed to be forever young. We're supposed to be static. You know, this entire anti-life system creates this neurosis and fear, which then, of course, feeds another whole industry in terms of plastic surgery and makeup and Botox and, and all of that alienates and separates us further and leaves us feeling lonely and empty, no real connection. None of us feel, the, you know, the, the love and the value and the appreciation that we all need and want. So hopefully people will feel from this conversation that it's helpful to know that this emanates from an economic system. It does not come from human nature. It's not human being. Don't believe that propaganda. Wake up and say to the need to change the economy. Well, you know, I, um, in the chapter I'm just writing, Yeah. I talk about the series of disillusionments that I've been through, you know? Yeah. So I, I told you I was a good little commie in Hungary, and then yeah. the Indian Revolution all of a sudden I realized what a dictatorial, brutal system it was. Yeah. You know, which it was. Yeah. And then I come to the North America, and all of a sudden, you know, of course, well, it's the, the, the Americans who are the heroes, they're the ones, you know, Wall Street prosperity and yeah. freedom and all this. Then I see Vietnam, where they murder three million civilians, poison the land, defoliate the forest. People are still dying of cancer because of the Agent Orange, for which America is not paying a cent of reparations. You know, so then that, that goes, there goes that illusion. Then for a while, I believe that, well, gee, the Russians screwed up socialism, but the Chinese will get it right. So I, so I start following the Cultural Revolution, ignoring the brutality that was being practiced against good human beings in the name of the Cultural Revolution. Because I, I want to maintain this illusion, you know. Yeah. Then I become a good Zionist, right? And I think as a, as a Jew who suffered, you know, family suffered in the Holocaust. Now we're going to establish this free state, and and the, and the barbed wire, the concentration camp, will be replaced by the boundaries of a proud, well defended state. Then I have to get disillusioned about that to find out that that's a very nice dream, but it, it happened at the expense of uh, imposing a nightmare on the indig indigenous yeah. population by dispossessing, expelling, and killing them. So we think disillusionment, we think, oh, I was disillusioning. And then I say to people, would you rather be, would you rather be illusioned or disillusioned? <laughs> Which would you rather be? Would you rather be illusions or disillusions? And Eric Fromm said that the people that make a difference in the world are the ones who are capable of tearing away the veil of illusion from the eyes of other people. And yeah. so I mean, that's what you're saying, so that I hope that people will become disillusioned because it's not a good thing to be illusioned. In other words, to, to believe what is not true and not to see what is true. So that if this conversation managed to disillusion anybody, I'd be really happy about that. <laughs> yes, although I would like to put it in a slightly more positive way. And okay. I would like to put it in uh, the way of listening more to your heart and your experience to here, for instance, you know, keep repeating what we said about grandmothers and how scientists had to prove that having a grandmother nearby is good for a grandchild. Yeah. Keep in mind that what we're talking about is actually not listening to, or, you know, it's not maintaining dissolution. It's waking up your body, your heart, and your experiential knowledge to listen to the truth that we need one another that we yeah. are caring, needing people, that we also have some models from indigenous traditional cultures. And what that has to do with 
is the humanity, is the human scale, the human interconnectedness, the fact that you depended on people whose name you knew, people you could speak to. You weren't dependent on an anonymous institution, either a giant government or giant corporations that you don't even know the names of. We depended on one another. And that is what localized structures can bring us. And it's doing that right now. I mean, we're actually seeing benefits right. on a small scale. Do you, know, do, you, Wade, yeah. do you know Wade, do you know Wade Davis at all? I do, I, I, a little okay. bit, yes. Yeah, yeah. So Wade studied Aboriginal peoples. He's an anthropologist, you know, and he studied yeah, Aboriginal yeah. all over the world, particularly in, in the South Pacific and, and also in Canada. And so this idea of wealth. So we think here that wealth is what we possess. But in other cultures, wealth is what you give away. The, the, the more you give away, the wealthier, you know, because they be good, because then you gain in human connection. Yeah. And, and yeah. in gratitude and in, and in, and in our community. So the one thing I do think, I do hope people get from this conversation is there's other ways of conceiving what humanity is all about. And now we've been, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, propagandized is one word, but it's, it's even more subtle than that. We've been uh, yeah. educa educated or imbued with a certain yes. view, uh, with a certain view that doesn't actually match reality. And, it, and it's that gap between who we are fundamentally and who we're made to be in this globalized culture that creates so much illness and so much dysfunction and so much unhappiness and so much despair, actually. And can you also say something about the examples of healing you're seeing? You know, how you could see that when there was the grandmother around or how you saw among those drug addicts in Vancouver that caring for each other, how important it is. Have you seen examples that give you you know, that, yeah, make your heart sing and give you hope. Well, I, I do, and I write about them. Um, <clears throat> amazing, amazing stories of healing that happen. Um, and it's usually, and, and I've, do, I've documented this, but actually it's also been documented by other researchers that, that even in, in certain conditions that are considered to be terminal and Western medicine doesn't, can't offer anything more. People actually come back and they heal. And this has been studied by a physician called Jeff Rediger from Harvard. I just wrote a book last year called Cured, uh, uh, an, uh, an oncological um, psychologist called Kelly Turner in her book, Radical Remission. And I've talked to both of these people. And what they say is that the fundamental healing agent, alchemic agent is actually a, a, a transformation of one's inner identity from that socialized, isolated view that this society promulgates to somebody who is much more expansive and connected and, and connected to the whole universe, actually. And that has a physiological impact sufficient in some cases to reverse fatal illnesses. And I'll tell you one more story. Uh, a, a colleague of mine, a physician, psychiatrist, uh, I'm not a psychiatrist, he, he is. His name is Louis Mel Madrona and he lives in the States and he's of Lakota indigenous background in part. And he said in the Lakota tradition, when somebody gets ill, it's not seen as an individual isolated event, that the community actually gathers around him and they say to him, we realize that your illness represents some dysfunction, some rip in the fabric of our community. So thank you for taking that on. And we're here to help you heal so that we can all heal ourselves. Mm -hmm. So they see the healing not as a which is actually healing is a arises from the root word for wholeness. And and so they see the healing not as an individual biological event, but as a communal, biological, psychological, spiritual event. Which is a very different way of looking at it. And it's far more scientifically accurate, actually. Yeah, amazingly. Yeah. Yeah. And particularly, of course, in our society where the toxic chemicals and the genetic modification, who knows the effect of the electromagnetic radiation. Um, it is a collective 
system that we also need to change. We, you know, it, it at some point it will be changed. I mean, we're going to have we're going to have we're going to have more serious crises for sure, aren't we? I think that's inevitable. But, yeah, but, but, but you know what? That's what I, Noam Chomsky once said that he was asked if he was a optimist or a pessimist, and he said, yeah. oh, he said. Um, Strategically, I'm an optimist, and tactically, I'm a pe pessimist. Which, which means that, in the long term, he sees the arc of history, um, barring climate disaster. By the way, um, yeah, history moving towards positive transformation. But in the short term, it's going to get worse before it gets better, and that's really my understanding of it. Yeah, and I, and I think the question for all of us concerned with it is not what results we can see in our lifetime but how can we contribute to the process so you through your movement for localization and particularly when it comes to food production and community me through whatever i do you know whoever's listening watching through whatever they're able to to contribute but it's taking a long arc view of of, of, of contributing to something that's larger than all of us yeah and not being attached to outcomes yeah but but I do also, I do want to make a plug as this final thing now for, you know, thanking you for supporting World Localization Day because we are seeing remarkable effects both in people and ecosystems. Yeah. When you support that principle of diversity, which is life. So the smaller scale farms diversified can provide for local markets. Farms have been forced to amalgamate and become bigger and bigger monocultures to survive in the dominant market, which are taxes subsidized, which are regulation support. But I'm so heartened by this upsurge everywhere you look, almost always led by women, by the way, but these smaller scale um, food systems that keep rising and keep coming back, even though they're stomped on by the dominant system by our laws, regulations, and a completely fake economy where dead food from the other side of the world is cheaper than local fresh organic food. And But despite that, the sort of building of those systems are so real and so healing for people and the planet. And so I'm really grateful to you for supporting that movement and for everything you've done, it seems that all your books and everything you stand for is in support of that life-based system and the rejection of the deadly monoculture, which is killing us. Well, it's about life capital, like John McGuire said, you know, and, and uh, what supports it is good and what doesn't support it is not good. Now, look, um, first of all, everything I understand about human beings, everything I learned about human beings and human life and development would predict the success of these enterprises that you're talking about. Yeah. For, for all manner of social, psychological, physiological reasons, you know? Yeah. So I'm not surprised when you tell me this micro successes or these major successes on the micro level. You know? Exactly. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Gabor. I hope we can talk again. I'm going to be very greedy and yeah. ask you again, I'm sure, because well, uh, be, be, it'd be a great pleasure. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. Okay, take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.